Hey guys, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at and covering an overview of Syslog. In addition to this, we'll be looking at how we can configure Syslog on our devices and verify the configuration. This video forms part of the CCMP Enterprise Core Exam Series 350 401. The exam topic covered in this video is 4.2, which is to configure and verify device monitoring using Syslog for remote logging. So first things first, Syslog is a logging mechanism built into all Cisco devices that collects logs generated by the device. These logs contain in-depth and rich detail regarding information relating to the device. These logs can provide fantastic benefit for alerting IT staff of issues and errors that have occurred on our device in the past or present. In addition to this, the Syslog events can also provide beneficial to determine the root cause of issues that have occurred in the past. So you've probably seen Syslog messages appear before when configuring Cisco devices. However, to provide a little bit more context, I've displayed one on the screen for you now. As you can see, Syslog events are displayed for all manner of events that have occurred on our Cisco devices. In this example alone, you can see that we've had three events logged to the console. One for the configuration that has occurred, one to notify us that Tunnel 1 interface has changed its state to up, and finally that we've formed an EIGRP neighbourship on Tunnel 1 with 192.168.13.3. As you can imagine, some events can be considerably more important than others. Take for example, an event being logged telling us an interface has gone down would be more important than informing us that configuration has taken place on the device. As such, the syslog events are split up into 8 categories, as displayed on the screen now. The alerts fall under one of the following categories. Emergency, Alert, Critical, Error, Warning, Notice, Informational and Debug. As you can see, the lower the syslog level, the more important the syslog message. We can tell what severity our syslog message is by taking a look at the syslog itself. As you can see from the original example we looked at earlier, a number appears in the middle of the message. Our first message is a severity of 5, which is a notice. Our second message is severity 3, which is classed as an error. And the last syslog is severity 5, which again is classed as a notice. It's worth noting, in fact, that our syslog output is formatted to provide us with a wealth of information. First of all, in green we have our timestamp of when the syslog event occurred. Next, in blue we have the facility tag. Each source on the Cisco device that generates syslog messages has its own tag. In this case, as the event refers to EIGRP, it's dual. As mentioned before, the number in purple is used to determine the severity of our syslog message. In this case, the event is a notice. In red displays the mnemonic, which is used to uniquely identify the syslog message. In this case, it's telling us that there's been a change to our neighbourship within EIGRP. Finally, in navy shows us text specific to the syslog event that has occurred. In the example, it's telling us that we've formed an EIGRP neighbourship on process 10, with 192.168.13.3 via our tunnel 1 interface. So syslog itself on a Cisco device can output to a number of locations. These include the console, a logging buffer, or a remote syslog server. First of all, by default, syslog messages are logged and displayed onto the console. As shown on the example on the screen, the messages are displayed to the console in real time, whilst we're physically connected to our device. If we're not consoled onto our device, but instead remoting on using SSH or Telnet, we won't be able to see the syslog output by default, as we're not directly connected to our device. As such, to see the syslog output when connected remotely, we need to run the command terminal monitor. Please note, however, that this will need to be ran every time a new remote session is opened with the device to see the syslog output. Next up, logging buffer. What this allows us to do is store our syslog messages within the memory on our device. By default, the size of memory allocated for syslog messages is 4096 bytes, so it's recommended to increase the size of our buffer as syslog messages are overwritten once full. Depending on the amount of events taking place on our device, could mean that important syslog messages are lost due to a lack of storage. We can change the size of the buffer allocated to syslog using the command on the screen. The command required is entered in a configuration mode and is logging buffered, and then the amount of bytes we want to allocate to our syslog storage. It's key that we don't allocate too much memory, else there'll be limited memory to perform other essential tasks on the device. It's also important to note before we move on, because syslog messages are stored in memory, these are lost upon reload of the device. We can view the syslog events saved within the buffer on our device by using the show logging command, as shown on the screen now. Before the messages are shown, we're provided with a little bit more information about the size of the buffer and the amount of messages currently logged. I'll then hit the spacebar and you can start to see the syslog messages within the buffer.
Finally, remote syslog. This is used to send all of our syslog events to a central server to store. This makes plenty of sense when you consider the amount of devices we have in our network reducing syslog events. It'd be a nightmare having to go around physically to each device to check the syslog events. In addition to this, it also removes the issue of syslog being lost when our device reloads, as the syslog events have been saved remotely on the server. Before we get into the configuration, syslog uses UDP port 514 to communicate with our remote syslog server. So now we're up to speed with syslog on our devices, let's take a look at the configuration we'll be using to push our syslog events to a remote server. Here in the example we can see that I've got R1, which is our Cisco device, and 192.168.1.253, which will be pushing its syslog messages to SO1, on 192.168.1.99. Before we get into the configuration, just a prerequisite. As you can imagine, syslog relies heavily on time and date being accurate on our devices. We need to be able to correlate syslog events to events that occurred in real time. If the time and date on our devices is incorrect, it's going to make it near impossible to accurately use syslog events for troubleshooting and monitoring purposes. It's recommended that the date and time on our Cisco devices be configured with NTP, so that the time doesn't fall out of sync and it's always accurate. To learn more about NTP, you can use the pop-up at the top of the screen now, or click on the link in the description. So before I start the configuration on our Cisco device, we need some software installed on our server that will collect all of our syslog messages. There's loads available to use, however in this example, I'm going to be using the SolarWinds free version called Kiwi Syslog. There's no configuration required, all we need to do is simply install the application and have it running on the server, as shown here. At the moment, we've got no syslog events, so let's jump over to R1 and complete the configuration. If I show you first of all, if I do a show run interface VLAN1, we can see that we've got an IP address in the 192.168.1.0 subnet. We'll then just confirm we can ping our syslog server, which we can do just fine. So what we'll do is go into configuration mode, and the command we need is logging, and then the IP address or host name of the syslog server. So in this case, it'll be 192.168.1.99. Once that's been done, we'll press enter and exit out of configuration mode. Now by adding some configuration to our device and exiting configuration mode, it should be enough to generate some syslog events. So let's jump over to SO1 and take a look. You can see within here are syslog events from R1 being logged and stored. It provides us with the exact same information we'd see on our devices. However, it breaks it up into tabbed views to make it easier to filter based on certain criteria. As you can see, the configuration for syslog itself is extremely straightforward and easy to configure. Another way we can confirm our configuration for remote syslog is by running the show login command again. Within here, we can see that we're logging to 192.168.1.99 using UDP port 514. Underneath this, we can see that we've had two messages that have been logged to our server. So before we end the video, I just wanted to cover a couple more topics relating to syslog I think will provide beneficial. First of all, we have the additional option of using sequence numbers in addition to the date and time stamps. This can make it a little bit easier to determine the event in which our syslog events occurred, instead of checking the time and date of each syslog event. We can enable this using the commands on the screen. The command service sequence numbers needs to be entered within configuration mode. Once this has been configured, you can see from the example that our syslog events are now prefixed with sequence numbers in the order the events occurred. Next up, you've got the option to enable synchronous logging. So by default, syslog's default action is to display syslog events as soon as they occur. However, this can cause problematic whilst we're trying to configure our Cisco device. You can see on the screen now what happens. Here you can see me trying to configure OSBF on my router, however syslog messages are displayed in the middle of the configuration, meaning that I'm no longer able to see what I'm typing unless I press tab. However, as soon as another syslog message is displayed, the issue will occur again. We can stop this by forcing syslog messages to only be displayed once configuration has been completed on the device. This is configured within the console line in configuration mode. Within here, we need to configure logging synchronous. Once enabled, you can see on the screen now that syslog events will be displayed separately on the console so that they no longer interrupt configuration or actions being completed on the device. One last thing before we end the video, if required you also have the option to disable syslog on a device. It's not recommended to complete this and should only be completed if required and you have a specific reason to do so. This can be completed within configuration mode by running the no logging on command. 
And there we have it. That's a complete overview of Syslog, how we configure it within our devices and verify the configuration. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments. Apart from that, remember to subscribe and like the video for more CCMP Enterprise videos. I hope you've enjoyed and I'll catch you next time.